Hello friends. This is Revenger what if how are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto was the overpowered son of Hades and fell in love with Goddess. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Naruto will also be two years older than Percy. He will be in 8th grade while the other boys are in 6th but will share Latin class with them, and will be kind of OOC. Dean Winchester's style and quirks will be mixed in with Naruto's own. He's gonna be kind of blunt, perverted, tough, and sarcastic, but Naruto wouldn't be Naruto without his love of ramen, pranks, and his verbal tick of, dadbeo. Naruto will be at the gentle age of 10 at the beginning, which is kind of short if you ask me, but we'll have a time skip after chapter 2. I'm just kind of experimenting with this story, but I hope you like it anyway lol. Enjoy. This, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. Hades, god of the underworld, said darkly to himself as he knelt next to the prone and beaten form of his son's ten-year-old body that had been discarded in a dark alleyway in the slums of Konohagakir no Sato. After he had died in this world, the elemental nations of the shinobi, as Minato Namikaze the Yandaimi Hokage and the infamous yellow flash of Konoha by sacrificing himself to the Shinigami, and sealing the Kayubi no Kitsune, a monstrous force of raw chakra in the form of an immortal fox into his own child, he had been devastated when his demigod wife Kashina Uchiha, daughter of Apollo and mortal Akari Uchiha, died and forced to leave Naruto Namikaze Uchiha as the Jinchuriki of Kayubi. He knew how the lives of Jinchurikis turned out to be, filled with constant fear of others, hatred and loneliness. Despite the popular belief that he did not care at all about his children and being labeled as a heartless bastard, he did not want this life for his son. The only reason he didn't and couldn't take his son back with him to Earth or back to the underworld was because of the pact that he had made with his brothers, Zeus and Poseidon. No, if they knew that he had broken the law of no longer siring demigod children, they would surely strike his child down without hesitance. He had made the decision to bide his time until Naruto was a fully-fledged ninja so he could take him home, but that was clearly the wrong move to make. His, dying wish, had been for Konoha to see his son as a hero for being the barrier between the Kyubi and them. But now, as he held his son's unconscious and severely battered body in his arms, it was painfully clear that his wish had not been granted. Where the hell was his old mentor, Jiraiya of the Sanin, the man he had appointed as Naruto's godfather, at he was supposed to be here taking care of his legacy, so where the hell was he? He knew that he could raid this entire village down with just a snap of his fingers, but no, he wouldn't do that. That would be too kind of him. Hades, once known to the elemental nations as Minato Namikaze, clutched his son's bloody and shivering form protectively against his chest, and stroked the bloodied and dirt-filled locks of Naruto's usually sun-colored spiky blonde hair. This just wasn't right. How could anyone treat a child like this? It didn't matter whether said child had a demon sealed in their person, it's still a child. To lay a hand onto an innocent child was unforgivable. After his son is all healed up, he is going to hunt down the ones who had put his son into this state, and well, have a little chat with them. As he looked his son over, he couldn't help but cringe at the sight of a child, his child, in this condition. His spiky blonde hair that was just like his personas in style and length was matted with blood and grime. His clothes, that were two sizes too big for his malnourished body, was torn and covered in blood, mud, and garbage. His sun-kissed skin was covered in bruises and cuts and his bare feet were blistered and cut open. Naruto was just so tiny and broken, that the tear that escaped the god of the underworld's eye couldn't stop itself from flowing down his unearthly handsome yet deadly face. Hades clenched his fists and snarled, the shadows of the night engulfing him in reaction to his righteous fury. He would not leave his son in the hands of these these humans any longer. He made the mistake of trusting these mongrels to care for his heir. It was time to take his son back to where he belongs until the day that he could claim him as his own when he enters Camp Half-Blood when he turns 14. He was going to let Konoha know just whose child they had harmed and he couldn't wait to see their reactions to him personally delivering the news. And once that was done, his beautiful boy will be safe in New York City, New York. M. Minato? the Sandame Hokage, Hiruzen Serutobi, the Professor, and God, 
of shinobi stuttered out as said deceased man stormed into his office in the hokage tower with an enraged look on his young and unblemished face hiruzen couldn't believe his eyes minato was here he knew it was truly him because he had the same chakra signature as his deceased predecessor and there was no way anyone could simulate that but h how he stuttered again as the young and dead man finally stopped before his desk his clenched fists trembling at his sides Minato took in a deep and calming breath so that he wouldn't lose control of his nerves in front of this man. He knew the man was old and knew that Hiruzen tried his best to keep his son safe, but it wasn't enough. Minato smirked at the man after he calmed himself down. I still am dead, old man. It was quite hypocritical of him, an immortal god, to be calling this man old of all things but he was an old human and Hades himself looked just like he did in his youth. I'm just paying a little visit to see how my son was doing and to see if my wish was being granted. Hiruzen flinched under the man's cold blue gaze. Obviously not since I found my legacy bleeding to death in an alleyway in the slums. Minato, spat out in disgust and outrage. Mina, Hiruzen tried saying, but quieted down when, Minato, held his hand up. Yes, I know that you tried your best Hiruzen Sama, but I cannot let this continue. Call up a village meeting. Make sure that every single citizen and shinobi is present. Minato, ordered. I have much to tell them. Minato, paused and then grinned an evil grin. It is time for them to learn the entire truth. Hiruzen's eyes widened at the implication. Surely you won't tell them that will you? Minato's only answer was for his grin to become more sinister looking. Hiruzen groaned in exasperation but conceded. This was going to be a long day. He could feel it in his aged bones. He could already see the extra paperwork that would be waiting for him after all this was over. In the center of Konoha an hour later, Konoha, Hiruzen Serutobi began, every single resident of Konoha, citizen and shinobi alike, all silenced down and paid rapt attention to their leader. I have asked you all to gather here today for an important announcement. Now, let me assure you, that what you are about to see and hear is the absolute truth that has been kept from you all as an sulfur monosulfide class secret. Let me welcome back for the evening our hero, Minato Namikaze, the former Yandaimi Hokage and Yellow Flash of Konoha. Hiruzen clapped his hands with a proud grin on his face as said man walked onto the stage and reintroduced himself to the stunned silence of his once beloved village. The only sound that could be heard was of the birds chirping in the sky above them. Konoha, Minato began just like Hiruzen, it truly is I, Minato Namikaze, the former Yandaimi Hokage of Hai no Kuni. And with proof, Minato, stated as he brought out an odd-looking kanai with three prongs and threw it into the air and disappeared in a yellow flash then reappeared where the kanai was last seen. The crowd began to cheer while others were still in disbelief before they too, began to cheer. Hades had to restrain himself from burning the village into ashes after he began to hear people in the crowd saying things like. The Yandaimi is back, he is back to slay the demon. That thing will no longer stain Konoha. Finally, the beast will be killed for everything it's done and taken from us. He cleared his throat and with a fake smile plastered on his handsome face, Minato said, Yes, as a human I was known as Minato Namikaze, your Yandaimi, but in reality, I'm not even immortal. Hades stated bluntly. He smirked evilly when he heard the shouts of, Imposter, and, Kill him, he's impersonating the Yandaimi. To be honest Konoha, I'm not even from this dimension. But all my feats as Konoha's yellow flash have all been true and done. I was the apprentice of Jiraiya the Toad Sanin. I did witness the war over Iwa and Kumo in the Third Shinobi War because of my own jutsu, the Hiraishin. I did have the honor of becoming the Yandaimi Hokage and I did seal away, not slay, and sacrifice myself to the Shinigami, because of the Kayubi. But the one important thing you did not know about me was that I was married to Kashina Uchiha and she bore my legacy, a son. More intakes of breath and cries of incredulity were drawn out of many in the assembly. And do you know who my son is? Minato asked. Shouts of negativity reached Hades' ears. My son is Naruto Namikaze Uchiha. The same child that you have all tortured for ten years. He exploded, his killing intent bursting out in uncontrolled waves, causing many to faint from fear and shock. Surely, that thing truly couldn't be his son, could he? It was all a lie, right? Sasuke Uchiha, the one and only survivor of the Uchiha massacre dealt at the hands of his big brother Itachi, 
Eyes widened at this turn of events. He had a living cousin. Why wasn't he ever told? He didn't care that it happened to be the Dobi of their class, he was family. My true name is Hades, brother of Zeus the god of the skies, and Poseidon the god of the seas, and I, Hades, am the god of the underworld. Monado, shouted as his form finally changed from a sunshine blonde haired man with cerulean blue eyes, into a more deadly and feral looking man. Gone was the exuberant Yandaimi that they had all accustomed to, and in his place was someone far more imposing and sinister. The man before them was around six feet seven in height. He was pale, almost sickly looking with waist length blonde hair with black and red highlights. His eyes were still blue, but had turned into shades darker till they looked like blue flames and they were literally glowing. His attire was anything but friendly. He was garbed in black demonic armor that had the appearance of scales or some kind of dragon complete with claws on the hands. On each shoulder was a large spike from which multiple smaller spikes emerged. Falling from the top of the spine were three chain-like tassels that resembled tails of some kind. Strapped to his back was a massive demonic scythe. The large weapon had a tapered point on the bottom, from which a flame-like pattern crept up the shaft. At the top, there were huge metal spikes, each one about a foot long. The blade itself seemed as tall thick as the wielder's arm with the length at least being as twice as long. Black and blue flames flickered around him, while the shadows crept along his feet. I, Hades, god of the underworld, will be taking back my son Naruto Namikaze Uchiha back with me to my world. You have all hurt my child in some way, and I am truly disappointed to have ever been affiliated with this village. I should have never trusted this pathetic waste of land to take care of my son, but I have now seen my wrongs and will now be correcting them. To all of you who have ever harmed my son in any way, whether it be by denying him food or laying a hand upon him, now know that I will personally attend to your soul when your time is due. He grinned maniacally. Hirazan, Hades snapped, and said man stood at attention. Inform Jiraiya that I am absolutely discontent with him leaving my child, his godson, to rot here with these vermins. The Sandame Hokage nodded. Jiraiya was in deep shit, that was for sure. Konohagakir no Sato. If I ever find out that any of you have abused any sort of child in this world, I will drag your soul to the underworld myself. Do you understand me, worms? Hades mocked. Everyone shakily nodded their heads. Hades looked out into the crowd and saw the familiar mop of silver hair and smiled grimly. The silver haired boy was no longer a boy, but a man, a true warrior. He could feel the man's lone dark gray eye, trying to burn a hole into him. Kakashi! Hades barked out and seeing said man flinch was laughable to him. He saw his ex-student as a son. He had even been named as Naruto's god brother before he and Kashina Chan died in this world. He knew for a fact that he was one of the only people of this world that cared for his son. Stop blaming yourself and get thee over the past. You did well in life, keep doing what you're doing and keep your loved ones safe and close to you. Don't push them away, Kakashi. I truly am proud of you, son. He watched as tears flowed down the silver-haired nin's face and couldn't help but smile softly at the sight. He truly was proud of Kakashi. The man had gone through so much loss and self-hatred, and yet there he was, still standing and fighting in what he believed in. He was, however, interrupted by a small and broken voice that came from beside him. Are you really my two san? Hades felt a small hand tug at his own and when he looked down, his immortal heart nearly broke into millions of pieces. Soulless cerulean blue eyes stared up at him in uncertainty. He was uncertain if this powerful being was telling the truth about being his father, or was it all just a trap for him to fall into and be humiliated by? The little blonde boy bit down on his bottom lip with surprisingly white teeth. He didn't know what to believe anymore. He was so confused and lost. Hades' eyes softened as he bent down so that he could look his beloved child in the eyes. Yes, I am your two san. Naruto's eyes widened before tears began to fall down his blood caked face. Why did you leave me? Didn't you want me? Did you? Did you ever love me? He sniffled out. Of course I did and do, my dear child. If it weren't for my wretched brothers, then I would have taken you home with me. I thought it too dangerous for you there and believed that you were going to be well taken care of here. But I was wrong and that will forever haunt me. I am so sorry, my son. If I had known what my decision would have cost you then I would have taken you, my brothers be damned. I have loved you since the moment I found out about you, and so did your mother, 
she wanted nothing more than to be here with you and take care of you, never doubt that, he said softly. Naruto cried some more before he launched himself into his father's waiting arms and began to bawl his little heart out. Hades held his son tighter to him, afraid to let go in fear that he would disappear, unfortunately, he knew that it was beyond early for his son to know about his existence and true form. I'm so sorry, my son. For everything. He mumbled into his son's ear. Once the boy was sound asleep from having cried himself to sleep. Hades pressed two fingers to the boy's forehead. And with that, he erased his son's memory of ever having any contact with him. I will watch over you from the shadows, my boy. Hades nodded his head respectively at Hiruzen who in turn bowed to him with deep respect of his own. He caught Kakashi's eye in the dispersing crowd and smiled. He received an eye smile back with a two-fingered salute from the silver-haired man. His loud and boisterous laugh echoed throughout Konoha, the only thing left from the man who had changed everyone's lives in some drastic way. No one noticed the little black-haired boy who stood in the shadows with now blood-red eyes with three tomos spinning rapidly. He would get his family back, one way or another. He would strike anyone down who tried to get in the way of his newfound goal. Don't worry Kusan, he thought to himself as he made his way back to his empty compound. I'll find you and bring you back home where you belong. With me, we'll bring back the glory of the Uchiha clan once again. I miss old man Hokage. A tall blonde haired boy sighed to himself as he lied down on his bed waiting for his adoptive mother, Ava Stanford, to arrive home from work. As the blonde thought back on his past, he couldn't help but flinch when he thought as far back as his childhood. Childhoods are where you get to go to the playground to make friends and play until your tiny bodies couldn't stay awake much longer. It's where you don't have to worry about responsibilities like going to work and paying bills. They're purely innocent. Naruto Uchiha never had that. His childhood was constant running from the people that he had wanted to become Hokage to protect. They had made it blatantly clear that they wanted nothing more than to make his entire existence a living hell. He could never play with the children around him because they were always dragged away and told to stay away from him because he was trouble and dangerous. And since they always believed their parents, they began to bully and scorn him. Naruto was strong and quick for his age and can handle one to two bullies at a time, but never more. His malnourished body didn't allow it, and thus, the gangs of kids always outnumbered him and always left him beaten and bloody in his own shame and weakness. Naru Chan, I'm home. A sweet feminine voice called out to him, immediately pulling him from his depressing thoughts. An ear-splitting grin overtook the frown on the blonde's handsome and chiseled face. Jumping out of bed, he ran out of his room and into where the voice was coming from. The front door. A beautiful American woman with long straight black hair that reached her hips, pale skin and large hazel green eyes was standing there with multiple bags in her arms. She was wearing a white blouse underneath a black blazer a black skirt that was two inches above her knees, and black high-heeled stilettos. She was lean and slim and quite short for a 28-year-old. Without her heels, she would be originally standing at the delicate height of 5 feet 1 making Naruto and his adoptive father, David Stanford who was 6 feet 1, tower over her. Mom, I'm not a 10-year-old kid anymore, you shouldn't call me that. You should call me Naruto. Here, let me help you, Naruto. Ava rolled her eyes playfully at her adoptive son's complaint. She waved a tiny hand dismissively, causing Naruto to huff. She grinned. Whatever, Naru chan She said, emphasizing on his childhood nickname that she had developed for him just to annoy him. It never failed. Help me with these bags, will ya? Naruto took the bags from his mother's arms and dutifully carried the grocery bags to the kitchen. How was your day mom? He asked as he set the bags down on the island in the center of their kitchen. Ava stood beside him, wiping sweat off her brow before heading over to the sink to wash her hands. Once done, she dried them off with a paper napkin then tossed it in the trash can once done. Ava shot a radiant grin at her son as she began helping him put the groceries away to where they belonged. It could have gone better. My clients are such hassles sometimes. She admitted with a duller grin as she thought about her job. She was a realtor who sold multiple mansions to the wealthy making her quite rich herself. Today, there was a woman who thought that the mansion that was being toured was too small and there were only two of them. What would she and her husband do with 15 bedrooms anyway? She asked as she turned around to face her son. He was leaning against the counter with his arms crossed against his chest and was paying rapt attention to what she was saying.
her stories were usually always interesting and downright insane. You should have heard her Naru Chan, said Boy snorted at the nickname. She was yelling and demanding her husband to find a larger and classier home to live in. He was so scared that he actually started shaking, Ava shuddered in remembrance. So I told her to leave him alone because he looked as though he were on the verge of having a panic attack. Then she began yelling at me, saying, who are you to tell me how to talk to my husband? And I was like, just leave the poor man alone. He has a right to say where he gets to live as much as you do, but no, she continued yelling at me until I finally kicked them both out and waited for my next clients to arrive. Naruto laughed when she waved her arms in exasperation at the whole situation she had found herself in. Sometimes he wondered where the woman found the patience to deal with people like that. He knew that he would have snapped at the first sign of disrespect. How was your day sweetheart? She asked as she took a hold of the frozen lasagna she had left out to cook for the night. Naruto rubbed the back of his head with a sigh, it was all right. Ava sighed sadly at the tone of sadness that underlined his nonchalant words. She knew her son too well to be convinced of the mask of happiness that he put up to hide the pain that he was really feeling. You were thinking about your past again, weren't you? She accused softly. Silence was her answer. She turned away from the oven that was now cooking the lasagna and set her sights on her son. He was a real looker for his age of 14. He had shoulder-length spiky blonde hair with two jaw-length bangs. His hair had natural black and red highlights, sun-kissed skin that was on the verge of being a light bronze, and narrow cerulean blue eyes. He stood at the height of 5 feet 9 and she knew that the boy was still growing. But the most noticeable and distinguishable thing about her son were the three adorable birthmarks that resembled whiskers on each cheek. He was wearing a tight black wife beater that was straining against his muscular chest, dark orange basketball shorts, and house slippers that resembled oversized black and white converse. His bright blue eyes that were always filled with bright and mischievous intent were now dim. The eyes that reminded her so much of the purest oceans were now murky from thoughts of the past that had damaged the poor boy's soul. She knew that the boy that she and her husband were willing to take in was constantly abused by his previous caretakers. Ava had read the reports on the boy's past from an anonymous source that had saved the boy. The papers stated that the boy with the brightest blue eyes she had ever seen was abused in almost every way possible. The unknown source had stated that if he had known what the boy had been going through, then he would have taken the boy away sooner. But alas, the damage had already been done. When they demanded to meet the boy, they were shocked to see the multiple scars and bruises that littered the boy's skin. The boy, Naruto Namikaze Uchiha, had only been at the orphanage for three days before they showed up. To know that her darling boy had been abused and tortured broke her heart. No one deserved that life, that kind of treatment, especially a child. She moved over to her son and stood right in front of him, he didn't dare look her in the eyes. Naru Chan, you're 14 years old now. You have been with your father and I for four years and you know that we would never lay a hand on you nor will we ever hate you. When we found out that we couldn't have children of our own, we were devastated. But when we met you, Ava paused there, her voice cracking with emotions that were threatening to overwhelm her. We fell in love with you. You have been our son since the moment we adopted you and we will never regret that. Look at me Naruto. Bright blue eyes stared down at her tears of their own now trailing down his tanned face. You must move on from the past. Forgive those who have hurt you because if you don't, then you give them the power over you. You are the strongest person I know, Naruto. You have been through so much yet you had the will to continue living on. I am so proud of you for that, son. But you must remember that you are not living that life anymore. Ava said softly. She was surprised when she was pulled into her son's embrace. I love you, mom. He whispered into her ear as he released her from his hug. Ava smiled at him. I love you too, Naru Chan. She sang out, trying to ease the tension that was in the air. Her son rolled his eyes and laughed at her teasing. He truly loved his new family. The next day, Naruto was on his way to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. His class was taking a trip to learn more about Greek and Roman mythology, and to be honest with himself, he was quite amazed with the subject. He found it interesting that there was a possibility of others who may or may not that exist and be immortal just like him. When he had been knocked out for the last time in Konoha, he had awoken in a dank sewer only to come face to face with the caged and withering form of the Kayubi no Kitsune. Flashback. 
Namikaze, the once great demon rasped out, hatred and resignation in his deep voice. Listen well as you are only going to hear this once. This seal that has imprisoned me for these past ten years is making my entire essence be absorbed by your pitiful and puny excuse of a meatbag. Once you awaken, you will be the new Kayubi no Kitsune. When the young Uzumaki, who did not know why this beast was calling him Namikaze, began to protest at his words, Kurama the Kayubi snarled. The threatening action did its job to silence the young son of its previous container, Kashina Uchiha. You will gain all my power and knowledge. Everything, from my memories of being separated from my eight counterparts and my father, the Rakuto Senen, to being sealed by your father, Minato Namikaze aka the Yandaimi Hokage of your worthless little village, will be forced into your brain. It will be quite painful for you, the Kayubi grinned menacingly. You will learn all my techniques and have all the raw strength and power to perform each and every one of them. You will also awaken your mother's accursed bloodline limit in the near future, the Sharingan of the Uchiha. But I will leave that to you to figure out how to learn because I want nothing to do with it. Kurama stated with an even deeper tone of hatred that was previously thought impossible by the young blonde. Your human form will stop aging once you reach the age of 18. When you reach that age, you will turn into a full-blooded demon. Unfortunately, you will not be able to be at full power until that age as well. Until then, you are but a Han Yu demon, half human, half demon. Since you were not born as a demon, you must learn to control the power before then or you will become nothing more than a ravaged beast bent on destroying everything in its path. Once I'm gone, you will be immortal. When you are a full-blooded demon, you will not be able to be killed because you will be pure chakra. Nothing short of being sealed will be able to keep you away. Then and only then, will you truly become the Kayubi no Kitsune. Wear my title well, Fleshbag. And with those parting words, the once great and power Kayubi no Kitsune, was dead and gone. The now newly crowned Kayubi no Kitsune, the nine-tailed demon fox, was stood gaping with tears trailing down his bloodied face in his wake. End flashback. Naruto was startled back to the real world when he heard a frustrated curse come from the person he saw as a little brother sitting beside him. Percy Jackson had shaggy black hair with bangs that swept to the side, big green eyes with long eyelashes, and a lightly tanned skin color. He was wearing a red shirt with a black jacket over it, worn blue jeans, and black converse. Then there was Grover, a boy that he had met through Percy and has become a best friend to him, who was African American with curly brown hair atop his head and a little goatee sprouting from his chin. He was wearing a forest green shirt and long black jeans that hid his shoes from view. By his side were his crutches because his legs, which were affected by some type of muscular disease, caused him to be crippled. But when it was enchilada day in the cafeteria he ran as though he was Forrest Gump. Naruto himself was wearing a casual v-necked gray t-shirt underneath a red and black long-sleeved flannel shirt. Over that was a dark and worn-out brown leather jacket with the collar slightly pulled up. His legs were covered by blue jeans that were ripped at the knees and his shoes were burnt brown Carhartt work boots. Around his neck was a silver army tag with the Japanese kanji for, Kayubi, written in the center in black. At the moment, he and Percy were getting extremely annoyed and agitated by the class bitch and kleptomaniac, Nancy Bobofit. She was currently throwing pieces of her peanut butter and ketchup sandwich at the back of Grover's head, who was trying to act neutral and unaffected by the girl's bullying for their sake. They both knew that Percy really wanted to do something about the girl if the tightening of his fists was any indication. But they all knew that he couldn't take action because odd things seemed to always happen around him, especially during school field trips that never failed to get him into trouble. I'm going to kill her, Percy bit out through clenched teeth. It's okay, Percy. I like peanut butter, Grover said with a shaky smile as he tried to dodge more of Nancy's lunch. Uh, that's it, Percy growled out as he tried to get up, only for Grover to stop him. When Percy didn't hear Naruto try to defend their friend, he turned to yell at the blonde only to find a barely hidden smirk gracing his, older brother's, whiskered face. He just knew that Nancy's day was going to go down the drain real fast. You're already on probation. Grover reprimanded the black-haired boy. You know who'll get blamed if anything happens. Percy laughed under his breath and said, That's true. But whoever said that it was going to be me that did anything? Grover blinked in confusion, before his dark brown eyes widened in realization. 
He quickly looked over to the tall blonde to warn him not to do anything rash, but he was too late. Naruto had rolled up his own sandwich into a ball, and without any warning, threw it with perfect aim at the red-headed girl's face. Nancy Bobofit, a girl with ginger red hair and crooked teeth, was having fun throwing her peanut butter and ketchup sandwich at Grover, the nerd of their class. She should feel bad about picking on a crippled boy, but felt no ounce of remorse whenever her friends would laugh at the boy's misfortune. She grinned and was about to throw more but was pushed back by a force that had smacked her right in the face. Her friends stopped laughing and the entire class was overtaken by silence. Stunned at the unexpected hit, Nancy screeched in disgust when she found out just what hit her in the face. It was a bologna sandwich. She could already feel the mustard burning her eyes and lettuce in her open mouth. Ew! She screamed as she tried to wipe the nasty food off her face, only to smear it all over her tomato red face. Everyone began to laugh as she stomped her foot in anger and humiliation. After the whole commotion was over and the redhead was clean once more, Mr. Brunner began to guide them through the big echoey galleries, past marble statues and glass cases full of really old black and orange pottery. He rode through the museum in his motorized wheelchair, passing by and telling the history behind each and every artifact with respect clear in his voice. Naruto looked over at Percy and laughed out loud when he saw the gobsmacked look on his face. He was literally gaping at everything that had survived two to three thousand years, yet was still in perfect condition. Dude, you're going to catch flies. Percy rubbed the back of his head sheepishly, a trait he had picked up from Naruto whenever he was nervous or embarrassed. I know, it's just, this stuff is really old, he said as he continued to look around at the multiple statues of the gods and goddesses that surrounded them. Though, there is some pretty interesting stuff here. Naruto admitted as he walked side by side with his best friend. Besides, Mr. Brunner is under the weird assumption that we both should know as much as possible about this shit. Easy for you to say, unlike me, you're actually interested in this stuff while I'm not. I'm just not any good at remembering their history. Percy huffed out irritatingly. Naruto nodded his head in understanding. Percy always tried to do his best in school but since he had both dyslexia and ADHD like Naruto himself, he had a hard time actually paying attention in classes. It didn't help that what they learned in Latin class had a bunch of big ass and complicated words. But unlike Naruto, he didn't put as much effort that the blonde did into studying because he lost his temper with the work too fast and usually just gave up. They turned their attention back on Mr. Brunner who was telling them about the gods and goddesses and were now currently gathered around a 13-foot tall stone column with a big sphinx on the top which he had said was a grave marker, a steel, for a girl who died when she was about their age. Percy, for once, was actually paying attention when Mr. Brunner started talking about the carvings on the sides but the kids around them were having loud and separate conversations while laughing loudly. Being the kind boy he was, Percy tried to tell them to please quiet down, but they ignored him, and Mrs. Dodds, their other chaperone who was also their pre-algebra teacher, who also seemed to loathe Percy for some reason, wasn't bothering to reprimand the others for their atrocious and disrespectful behavior. She would always just give Percy a death glare every time Percy would tell the groups of kids to shut up. Mrs. Dodds was this little math teacher from Georgia who always wore a black leather jacket, even though she was 50 years old. She looked mean enough to ride a Harley right into your locker. She had come to Yancey halfway through the year, when the last math teacher had a nervous breakdown. Once, when Percy had told Naruto and Grover that he didn't think Mrs. Dodds was human, Grover had looked at Percy real serious and said, You're absolutely right. Naruto had just nodded his head in agreement with Percy while also throwing a suspicious and confused sideways glance at their friend. When Nancy was making fun of a statue of a naked man on the steel, Percy finally lost his patience and practically yelled, Will you shut up? at the annoying redhead. Mr. Jackson, came the calm voice of Mr. Brunner, did you have something to add? Embarrassed at his outburst, Percy shook his head and said, No, sir. Mr. Brunner pointed to one of the pictures on the steel and asked Percy what it represented. It's Kronos eating his kids, right? Percy guessed with a careless shrug. Mr. Brunner nodded his head in confirmation. And can you tell me why he would eat his children? Naruto, seeing his little brother struggle with answering the question, answered for him. The psycho dude ate his kids because he had gotten a prophecy that said that his kids were going to rise to power and take over like he did. Percy let out a sigh of relief when the spotlight was taken off of him. 
Kronos, the Titan Lord, ate his children because of that but he had only set the prophecy in motion and screwed up because his wife, Rhea the Titaness, had hid his last-born Zeus and gave the man a rock to eat instead. Mr. Brunner nodded. When Zeus was older, he tricked his father into barfing up his brothers and sisters to set them free. There was a war between the Titans and gods, but the gods won. Naruto is so smart. Most of the girls swooned in appreciation and lust, making the boys glare at said boy in jealousy. Naruto groaned in annoyance while Grover and Percy laughed at his situation. Maybe I should start wearing baggy clothes and a face mask from now on, Naruto thought to himself. A handful of girls though, were disgusted that Kronos had ate his children and had literally thrown them up. That caused a horrid mental picture to star in their heads, making them want to puke themselves. The boys simultaneously rolled their eyes at the girls' behavior. Like we're going to use this in real life. Everyone heard Nancy mumble to her friends. Like, it's going to say on our job applications, please explain why Kronos ate his kids. And why, Mr. Jackson and Mr. Uchiha, to paraphrase Ms. Bobofit's excellent question, does this matter in real life? Busted. Grover muttered quietly, but apparently not quiet enough because Nancy, Naruto, and Percy all heard him. Shut up. The three of them hissed at the same time, the former's face going as red as her hair from being picked to answer as well. At least Nancy got packed, too. Mr. Brunner was the only one who ever caught her saying anything wrong. It's like the dude had radar ears. I don't know. Percy shrugged again. Naruto rolled his eyes. If we ever go to Greece, end up in another school with a mythology course, like college perhaps, then I guess it would be good to be prepared to have the necessary information. Mr. Brunner nodded in acceptance. Correct, Mr. Uchiha. Half credit to both of you boys. Zeus did indeed feed Kronos a mixture of mustard and wine, which made him disgorge his other children, who of course being immortal gods, had been aging and growing completely undigested in the titan's stomach. The gods defeated their father, sliced him into pieces with the man's own scythe and scattered his remains in Tartarus, the darkest part of the underworld. On that happy note, it's time for lunch. Mrs. Dodds, would you mind leading us back outside? Nancy and the rest of her friends were yelling about the thought of a man eating and barfing up people, while the guys were playfully pushing each other around. Percy, Grover, and Naruto were about to follow after them, only to be stopped by Mr. Brunner. Mr. Jackson, Mr. Uchiha. Both boys told Grover to wait for them outside while they listened to what their teacher had to tell them. They knew what was coming, sir, they chorused. The both of you must learn to answer my question. You mean about the Titans? Percy asked, confused. About real life, Mr. Brunner corrected, and how your studies apply to it. Oh. The boys mumbled, but Naruto had the sinking feeling that the wheelchaired man knew more than he was letting on. What you boys learn from me is vitally important. I expect both of you to treat it as such. I will only accept the best from the both of you, Percy Jackson, Naruto Uchiha. They nodded their heads, but were both pissed because Mr. Brunner was pushing the two of them a little too hard. Naruto noticed the man giving the steel a sad look. Maybe the man knew her in real life and had gone to her funeral. Yeah, that wasn't likely. Outside. The class gathered on the front steps of the museum where they could watch the traffic along Fifth Avenue. All three boys noticed that a storm was brewing in the sky. Percy turned to Naruto and asked, What do you think is going on with the weather? Naruto gave his best friend a disbelieving look. Do I look like a weatherman to you? He snarked playfully. Percy shook his head sheepishly. Naruto snorted in amusement. But seriously, I don't know dude. It's weird because no one else seems to notice the clouds other than us. Percy nodded his head. He looked back up to the sky and sighed. He personally thought it may be global warming or something because the weather all across New York had been weird since Christmas. They already had massive snowstorms, flooding, and wildfires from lightning strikes. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a hurricane blowing in. Percy thought gloomily. The boys then joined Grover who was sitting by the fountain and sat down to eat, since the both of them didn't like to be bothered and Naruto was the heartthrob of the school and had tons of fangirls and boys, which Percy and Grover found extremely hilarious, they thought it would be best for them not to surround themselves with large groups of people and attract unwanted attention. Also, they wanted to separate themselves away from the kids from the public schools who were also there, while Naruto didn't really mind because he was used to heartless criticism, 
Percy and Grover didn't want anybody to know that they were from that school. The school for loser freaks who couldn't make it elsewhere. Grover looked over when they joined him. Detention? He asked as he bit into his apple. No, Percy shook his head. Not from Brunner. I just wish he didn't expect so much from me. I'm not a genius. Naruto rolled his eyes. I've been doing that a lot lately, he mused to himself. It's like the dude knows something about us. Hey man, Naruto nudged Percy, maybe we're related to some Greek god. The two troublemakers looked at each other and burst out laughing. Grover joined them, however it was more of a nervous laugh. While Percy and Grover were talking, Naruto looked up to the storm clouds and thought back to the elemental nations and sighed sadly. He wondered how old man Hokage and the Ikarakus were doing. Did they miss him? Did they even remember him? He also wondered what his life would be like if he still lived there. Would things have changed for him? Would they have gotten better, stayed the same or God forbid, worse? But he knew better than to dwell on those questions. If he had it his way, he was never going back. Things would have stayed the same, or gotten worse. There was no doubt about that. If they knew that he truly had become the demon, Naruto sighed again. He really should stop thinking about his past. Although he occasionally stayed in a dorm with Percy and Grover at the academy, his parents always picked him up so that he could hang out with them for all their sakes. The principal understood after he had heard their story. Not even Percy knew the whole truth behind his childhood, and they were like brothers. Maybe he should tell him that he wasn't even from this world? Naruto shook his head at the idea. He wouldn't be able to handle it if Percy became wary or fearful of him. He was far too different from everyone else. He didn't want to risk his and Percy's friendship. It's not like there are others with powers and are immortal like him in this world. Oh, how wrong he was. Nancy Bobofit despised Percy Jackson and his little gang of misfits. Sure, Naruto Uchiha was definitely the hottest guy she has ever come across, but his affiliation with Percy didn't make her hate him any less. It just made Naruto a loser just like him. There was nothing better to her than watching Percy Jackson get in trouble and she knew what his weakness was. Grover Underwood, the crippled nerd. She knew that Percy did everything he could to protect the guy from her or anyone else that tried to pick on him. But no matter how discreet the black-haired boy tried being about getting back at everyone, he just always seemed to get caught and into some serious trouble. She didn't know why she hated him so much, she just did. And that's why when she decided to interrupt the little trio when they were eating their lunch while sitting on the edge of the water fountain, she didn't think twice about dumping her lunch all over Grover. Oops. She grinned, her friends snickering loudly behind her. She watched in glee as Percy's face became red with anger, his eyebrow twitching in annoyance as he jumped up and looked to be reaching out for her neck in pure hatred. Naruto, seeing this, quickly grabbed Percy's arm and yanked the boy back down while also glaring at the red-headed wrench named Nancy Bobofit. Don't, Naruto mumbled to a seething Percy who began helping Grover clean himself off from the unexpected dump on his head. You can't afford to get yourself into any more trouble or you'll get your ass booted out of Yancey for good. The blonde stood up, nonchalantly crumbling up the remains of his own lunch and tossing it into the trash can on the other end of the fountain. Icy blue eyes slowly looked the redhead up and down, sorely unimpressed. What the is your problem, Bobofit? He spat out, his arms crossed over his chest. His jaw was clenched, the bone ticking in motion with his flexing biceps. Nancy did her best not to show how intimidated she really was, but her trembling hands weren't fooling anyone. Gulping down her fear and painting on her best glare, she said, He's my problem. I can't stand looking at his stupid ugly face. She pointed a finger at Percy, causing said boy to glare daggers at the girl. You're the one with the ugly face here, Nancy, Percy growled out. And then something unexpected and completely unnatural happened. Nancy Bobofit suddenly fell into the water fountain, making a loud and audible splash that caught everyone's attention including Mrs. Dodds. Mrs. Dodds, Percy pushed me. She spluttered out, spitting water out of her mouth and shivering from the cold water that covered her from head to toe. She watched in embarrassment as her so-called friends stared and whispered about her display to anyone and everyone that was around them, their giggling grating on her nerves. But neither Percy nor Naruto were paying any attention to her. They were trying to come up with a plausible explanation as to how Nancy even fell into the water when she was standing in front of it and no human had touched her. Naruto could have sworn that he had saw a tail of water sprout out from the fountain and grab onto Nancy's ankle and pull her in, 
But that was impossible right? He felt no flare of chakra because no one had any chakra in this world. Mr. Jackson, Naruto heard Mrs. Dodd's deceptively sweet voice ring out, come with me, dearie. No, wait, I pushed her, Grover yelled, his voice filled with panic and worry for his friend. Oh, did you now? Mrs. Dodd's unamused voice questioned. Yes, I did. I swear. Grover stuttered out, intimidated by Mrs. Dodd's cold stare. You know better than to swear on anything, boy. Mrs. Dodd's hissed out, her tone irritated. It was absolutely clear that she didn't believe a word that the Underwood boy spoke out. She turned back to a stunned Percy, glare still in place. Follow me, Mr. Jackson. Percy, who was in shock that Grover had tried to take his punishment for him, robotically followed Mrs. Dodds who was leading him back into the museum. Oh no, Grover moaned out, holding his head in his hands, he's going to get another detention, he might even get kicked out of the academy. Why did you say that you were the one that pushed her, bud? Naruto questioned, blue eyes watching Percy's and Mrs. Dodd's figures disappear into the museum. You were obviously sitting down the whole time. Grover lifted his head up to watch his blonde-haired friend with guilty eyes. I'm the one Nancy was targeting, not him. He said as he motioned towards the museum where Percy was likely getting his last scolding as a student of their school. Don't sweat it man. I'm sure that Percy wouldn't get kicked out for something that can't be proved. No one saw him do it. Naruto assured his friend. Grover smiled, happy that he had such good friends that always looked out for him. I got to take a piss. Naruto said, effectively ruining what he deemed to be a chick flick moment while stretching his arms above his head. His shirts lifted up, displaying a tiny show of his six packed abs to everyone around them. All the girls swooned, large blushes covering them from face to neck. They all had a glazed over look as they stared at Naruto, who had finally realized his mistake. Gulping nervously, Naruto began to walk away as quickly as he could from the admiring eyes. Be back in a minute. G man, he called over his shoulder as he hurried through the museum's doors, ignoring said boy's laughter that followed him all throughout his departure. He missed the way Grover's eyes widened in horror a second later. Crap, Naruto, wait. He also missed the way Grover waved his arms frantically to grab Mr. Brunner's attention. In the museum. What a load off. Naruto sighed pleasantly as he washed his hands after finishing his business. Closing the restroom door behind him. Naruto began to walk down the long hallway with his hands tucked into his pockets, singing quite atrociously and loudly, Ramble On, by Led Zeppelin to himself. For now I smell the rain and with it pain, and it's headed my way. Sometimes I grow so tired, but I know I've got one thing I got to do. Ramble on and now's the time, the time is now, too. Sing my song I'm going around the world, I got to find my girl, on my way. I've been this way ten years to the day, ramble on. Gotta find the queen of all my Drea, his laid-back actions were rudely interrupted however, when a scream rang out throughout the halls, causing him to unconsciously draw on his power, his eyes turning a blood red with split pupils. Menacing black claws sprouted from his fingertips, and his ears pricked up to try to find the location of the source of the horrified scream. His eyes widened once he realized just whose scream that was. Shit, I should know that girly ass scream by now. Percy, bud, hold on, he yelled out as he ran, becoming nothing but a red blur. He burst into the room with a loud bang, Naruto, run. Percy yelled out, his voice trembling with fear as he spotted that it was his best friend that had come into the Greek and Roman section with him and Mrs. Dodds. He didn't want his big brother to get hurt, or worse die, because of him. He would never be able to forgive himself and he knew that if anything were to happen to Naruto, he would be overcome with a grief that had the possibility of completely destroying him. Besides his mom and Grover, Naruto was all he had. The now cerulean blue eyes narrowed as he spotted just what Percy was running like hell from. Flying behind him, had to be the most hideous thing Naruto had ever laid his eyes upon. Floating in the air was some kind of womanly figure with eyes that were glowing like barbecue coals. It had gray skin that was pulled taut against its bones with sharp yellow teeth and leathery black wings that reminded him of Jeepers Creepers. Where is it? A deep, guttery voice came from its throat. It sounded as though it smoked ten packs of cigarettes a day, if not more. What the is that? Naruto hissed to Percy, who was currently staring at the thing with wings with wide sea-green eyes. 
The look brought out the protective side of Naruto, who without hesitation, placed himself in front of Percy's body and got into a loose, and confident taijutsu stance. Naruto's eyes flashed red at the creature, making the winged thing widen its eyes in realization and hesitance. Naruto became confused at this creature's actions. Why wasn't she moving to strike him down like she was trying to do with Percy? This has nothing to do with you, boy, it said, flying back a foot. Naruto became even more confused. What the ing hell was going on around here? This is between me and him. A bony and clawed finger pointed behind the blonde, right at Percy. Now let me ask again. Where is it? Do you have any idea what it's talking about? Naruto asked the still figure behind him. Percy quickly shook his head. No Mrs. Dodds dragged me away to give me my punishment, when she suddenly turned into that. That's Mrs. Dodds? Naruto's nose wrinkled in disgust at the smell that was wafting off the now discovered Mrs. Dodds. She smelled like a encrypt. Like decay. What the does she want from you dude? Hey, maybe you're her type. Who knows man, she could be your one true love. He grinned, wriggling his eyebrows over his shoulder at his friend. Naruto returned his attention back to the Jeepers Creepers reject. A look of pure disgust and rage was on her face at the insinuation. She had heard what he said and was not at all pleased. He could feel Percy's annoyed glare on his back and despite the situation they were in, Naruto let out an amused and wise smirk. I still got it, he thought in smugness. Ew, what? No, you freakin', Percy huffed out. They were brought out of their distracted conversation when a familiar voice yelled out to them, Percy. Naruto. What ho? Both boys caught the items that Mr. Brunner tossed them out of the air. The two best friends discovered that they were both holding ballpoint pens. While Percy's was a majestic shining gold, Naruto's was a pitch black pen that looked as though it was made out of darkness itself. A second later, both pens turned into completely different objects altogether. Percy's turned into a sword. Mr. Brunner's bronze sword which the wheelchaired man always used in the tournament game that he ran for his classes for fun and amusement. Naruto's was the opposite of Percy's. Instead of a golden sword, his turned out to be a large sword that was comparable in size to Zabuza Momochi of the Mist's Kabikirabocho. It was pitch black with a small blood red skull at the tip of the handle. The center of the blade was wrapped in white bandages, stained with what the blonde presumed to be blood. My new master. A monstrous voice purred wickedly into his head, making Naruto look around before he realized that it was his new sword that was speaking to him. His eyes widened. The Ing sword was sentient. Finally, blood will be spilt onto my blade once again. Naruto's eyes turned red once more, only now they were filled with nothing but malicious and bloodthirsty intent. There was absolutely nothing human left in his lifeless blue eyes as he stared at the creature before him. Before Percy could move or even think of using his newfound sword, Naruto disappeared from in front of him only to suddenly reappear in front of Mrs. Dodds with his own new sword raised to strike. I didn't even see him move, Percy yelled in his mind. Without any remorse or hesitance, Naruto slashed at Mrs. Dodds until she was nothing but gold powder leaving behind the putrid scent of sulfur and a dying screech that echoed throughout the entire room. Once she was gone, Naruto's eyes went back to their light blue and the voice in his head vanished. Naruto and Percy stared at each other, simultaneously drawing out sighs. Their eyes looked over to where Mr. Brunner had been, only to find him long gone. Turning their weapons back into their pen forms, they began their trek back out to the museum's courtyard. Percy was pouting and complaining the whole way about how he didn't even get to use his sword because Naruto had become stingy. Naruto's eye twitched at his little brothers, complaining, Percy? Yeah, shut up. When they reached the courtyard, Nancy Bobofit instantly began to hound them. I hope Mrs. Kerr whipped your asses to kingdom come. Who the hell is Mrs. Kerr? Percy questioned the redhead, only for said girl to roll her eyes and mumble out, what dumb asses as she walked away. Confused, they asked Grover who Mrs. Kerr was he only stuttered out, she's our math teacher but with the way his ears were turning red, they both knew that he was lying. Ah, those would be my two pens. Mr. Brunner said as he rolled up to them, please begin to bring your own writing utensils, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Uchiha. Um, okay. The best friends mumbled out. Percy gave his pen up with hesitation, while Naruto couldn't wait to get that sword transformed as a pen as far away from him as possible. 
It filled him up with so much rage and bloodlust, he shivered. But once it was out of his hands, he instantly felt as though a huge part of him was whipped away from him. He shrugged the cold feeling off. Sir, where is Mrs. Dodds? Percy questioned, eyebrows furrowed in bewildered confusion. Why was everyone acting so normal? Especially Mr. Brunner who had saw the whole thing go down. He was even the one who gave them their weapons for the love of God. Blank eyes stared at them. Who? He replied monotonously. Our other chaperone, sir. She was our pre-algebra teacher. Naruto replied as he stared into Mr. Brunner's eyes. Naruto's eyes narrowed when he saw a hint of deception in the man's brown orbs only to disappear completely as though it was never there. A concerned frown overtook the wheelchaired man's face. Percy, Naruto, there has never been a Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy. Are you both feeling all right? He asked with a soft voice. Percy and Naruto looked at each other. They both knew that they were being lied to and they didn't appreciate any of it at all. They were tired of constantly being lied by mostly everyone around them but they knew they had to be patient this time around to see how things played out. You must have gotten Mrs. Kerr's name confused with someone else's. An old teacher, perhaps? Anyhow, don't concern yourselves over it boys. Mr. Brunner said cheerfully before wheeling off. Come now, it's about time we head back into the museum to finish our tour. What the hell? The boys mumbled out together. They glanced at each other one last time, the looks easily conveying, we'll talk about this later, before following Mr. Brunner back inside. Percy Jackson was used to being in weird situations. He was used to getting into trouble that either had him getting kicked out of his school, suspended, or expelled. They were usually always over quite quickly and he was back on his feet soon after like nothing ever happened. It has been weeks since the whole fiasco with Mrs. Dodds happened back at the museum. It seemed like ages ago but he just couldn't wrap his head around it. Was Mrs. Dodds really real? Had she truly become some monster that only wanted to kill him or was it all some type of hallucination that he convinced himself he was having? Everyone denied there was ever a Mrs. Dodds that taught at their school. In Mrs. Dodds' place was a perky blonde woman by the name of Mrs. Kerr. The complete opposite of the old and hostile lady that had turned into some shriveled up old winged hag that was dead set on ripping his head off if Naruto hadn't intervened. Every time he brought up the name Mrs. Dodds, everyone would look at him as though he belonged in the mental institution with a straight jacket in the works. He had even begun to bang his head lightly against the wall out of frustration. He was beginning to believe that he should admit himself in a loony bin, too. But if it weren't for Naruto always reassuring him that Mrs. Dodds really did exist and he had in fact killed her, then he would have truly lost his mind long ago. But there was one person who they could count on to not entirely dismiss her existence as some type of ed up joke. Grover. Grover had always been a horrible liar. He would begin to sweat and stutter, his face turning red and his eyes avoiding their gazes. But still, he continued to lie to the both of them. Percy was livid that his friend would keep something so drastic away from him, especially since it considered his best friend too. He would wait until the right moment to make Grover spill the truth to him because he knew the boy knew something was up. The crippled boy was adamant on trying to convince them that Mrs. Dodds wasn't real. He would say that he didn't know who they were talking about, and that they had made her up. The freak weather continued, which set poor Percy even more on edge. One night, a thunderstorm had blew out the windows in the trio's dorm room. A few days later, the biggest tornado ever spotted in the Hudson Valley touched down only 50 miles from Yancey Academy. Percy started feeling cranky and irritable most of the time. His grades slipped from D's to F's. He got into even more fights with Nancy and her friends and was sent out into the hallways in almost every class. When his English teacher, Mr. Nickel, basically called him lazy, Percy snapped and called the man an old sot. The headmaster had sent his mom a letter the following week. He would not be invited back next year to Yancey Academy. Whatever, Percy thought, that's fine. I'm so over these s anyways. But there were some things he would miss about Yancey Academy. Mr. Brunner and his faith in him. But most of all, he would miss his two best friends. Well, Naruto can certainly protect Grover, he thought to himself as he switched the lamp that was placed on his mess of a desk off. And with those final thoughts, he closed his eyes only to be met with talons and leathery wings. The next night, right now, the duo were sitting in their dorm room. Percy was studying for his upcoming Latin exam while Naruto was at his computer, giggling like a schoolgirl every few seconds. 
Grover had claimed that he needed to strengthen his legs, hobbling out of the room as fast as his legs would let him. Neither boy mentioned that it was near midnight and that Grover could be caught for roaming the halls after curfew. They saw it as petty revenge for their friend hiding things from them. Damn it! This is impossible! Percy yelled, throwing his Cambridge Guide to Greek mythology book across the room. Unfortunately, the book landed on the back of Naruto's blonde haired head. Son of a bitch! Naruto hissed, clutching his head as he spun away from the computer and sent a chilling death glare at his best friend who was now pouting sulkily across the room. What the hell, man? Percy looked at his best friend his eyes watering slightly, shit, Naruto thought, anything but those. The black-haired twelve-year-old continued to look at his friend with puppy dog eyes, unwilling to apologize and hoping that Naruto would forgive him without Percy having to utter a word. Naruto rolled his eyes. Whatever man. He relented, turning back to his computer with a big and lecherous grin on his face. His eyes roamed over the luscious body that was displayed on the screen, causing his face to redden and his nose to leak a bit of blood. Shit! He yelped as he quickly stood up and crossed the room for a Kleenex that was on Grover's nightstand. He grabbed one and held it to his nose, the blush still spread across his face. Seeing this, Percy raised an eyebrow at him. What's wrong with you? Naruto shrugged, looking away from his friend as he mumbled, nothing. Percy narrowed his eyes. Red face, bloody nose, his eyes widened before he snorted in amusement as he glanced over at Naruto's computer. There was a woman's curvaceous body proudly displayed on the blue-eyed boy's computer for the entire world to see. A blush quickly overcame Percy's own shocked face. A Kleenex was shoved into his face and he snatched it away from Naruto's hand as he held it to his nose that he barely realized was bleeding too. He glared at the blonde. This is all your fault. Naruto laughed as he walked back to his computer and turned the electronic device off. You're a perv too, dude. That ain't my fault. He quipped as he threw himself onto his bed after throwing the bloody tissue away. Percy scoffed. Why did you throw that big ass book at my head anyway, but face? Naruto questioned as he looked at his friend. My dyslexia was messing with my head again. Percy grumbled as he tossed his tissue into the tiny black trash can near his bed. There's no way that I'm going to remember the difference between Karen and Chiron. They might as well be the same damn person. He got up, pacing around the room. Naruto watched him, perplexed. That's simple, bud. One has an A and the other has an O, he said simply. He was glared at for his advice. He smiled sheepishly as he rubbed the back of his head. I don't know man. We suffer from the same shit. Maybe you should pay Mr. Brunner a visit. I'm sure the old man would be glad to help you since you're his favorite student. Percy paused at this before nodding. All right. He glanced over his shoulder at the blonde that was still lazing about on his bed, picking at his teeth. Are you coming? Naruto nodded as he threw on his jacket and slipped on his still laced up boots before following his friend out their dorm room. Dude, have I ever told you that you completely suck? Naruto asked boredly as they strolled down the dark and quiet hallway that led to Mr. Brunner's office. Yes. Percy deadpanned with a roll of his eyes. Angeline Jolie or Megan Fox? The blonde questioned randomly. Percy thought this over as he stroked his chin. Angelina Jolie, he whispered with a grin. Naruto nodded a proud nod. I'm glad I took you under my wing and taught you the ways of manhood, Naruto said proudly with a puffed out chest. Percy laughed at him. His friend could be such an idiotic goofball sometimes. Okay, most of the time. They once again fell into a comfortable silence before Naruto began to sing Lonely is the Night by Billy Squire silently. Lonely is the night when you find yourself alone. Your demons come to light and your mind is not your own. Lonely is the night when there's no one left to call. You feel the time is right, say, the writings on the wall. It's a high time to fight when the walls are cloing in. Call it what you like, it's time you got to win lonely, lonely, lonely your spirits sinking down. You find you're not the only stranger in this town. Naruto quieted down once he saw Mr. Brunner's office down the hall. All of the teacher's offices were dark and dim, except for Mr. Brunner's whose door was cracked ajar. The duo quickened their paces when they saw the light that was stretching across the hallway floor. They were about three steps away from the door handle when they heard voices coming from inside. When they realized just whose voice it was, they froze. 
Worried about Percy and Naruto, sir. They tossed confused glances at each other before Naruto held a finger to his lips and gestured for him to be silent and just listen in. Percy hesitated because he wasn't usually an eavesdropper but he was damn curious and from the look in Naruto's blue orbs, he knew that he was as well. Why the hell were they discussing them anyway? Alone this summer, Grover said, I mean, a kindly one in the school. Now that we know for sure, and they know too. We would only make matters worse by rushing them, Mr. Brunner said calmly. We need Percy to mature more. But Naruto, there is something, he paused, as if considering his next words, off and different about him, something powerful. Percy glanced curiously at his big brother figure. Naruto shrugged so Percy went back to listening to Mr. Brunner's and Grover's conversation, completely missing the guilty look that shadowed Naruto's chiseled features. I'll tell you soon. Just not now. I'm sorry bud. Naruto promised Percy inwardly. But they may not have time. The summer solstice deadline. Will have to be resolved without them both, Grover. Let them enjoy their ignorance while they still can. Sir, they saw her, their imagination. Mr. Brunner insisted patiently. The mist over the students and staff will be enough to convince them of that. Mist. Naruto mouthed at Percy, blonde eyebrows furrowed. Percy shrugged his shoulders, his eyes wide at the weird conversation that they were listening in on. About us, he thought. Sir, I, I can't fail my duties again. Grover's voice was choked with emotion. They never heard their friend sound like that before. You know what that would mean, he sniffled. You haven't failed, Grover, Mr. Brunner said in his fatherly voice. I should have seen her for what she was. Now let's just worry about keeping the boys alive until next fall. The mythology book that Percy had taken with him fell to the floor with a thud. Naruto quickly grabbed Percy's shoulder and led the shocked boy down the hall and into an empty classroom where they would still be able to hear the conversation that left them with more questions than answers about the whole Mrs. Dodds situation. They ing knew it. The conversation went silent. Percy stiffened when a shadow slid across the lighted glass of Mr. Brunner's office door, the shadow of something much taller than the wheelchair-bound man, holding something that looked suspiciously like a crossbow. Nothing. Mr. Brunner murmured. My nerves haven't been right since the winter solstice. Mine neither, Grover agreed, but I could have sworn. Go back to your dorm. You've got a long day of exams lined up for you tomorrow. Mr. Brunner said. Don't remind me. Grover groaned. A few seconds later, the lights went off in his office and they heard a strange clopping sound echoing down the hallway. Once they could no longer hear anything, they hurried back to their dorm room so that they would be there before Grover. Hey guys. Grover said when he entered their dorm room, he hobbled back to his bed, he leaned his crutches against the wall, and sat heavily onto his bed with a sigh. He looked over at his friends each lying in their own beds. He held back a grin when he saw the green nightcap with large round eyes that was sitting on top of Naruto's blonde mop of hair. He looked over at Percy and saw how pale and shaky his friend was. His eyes widened in concern. Whoa, Percy. You look awful, he frowned. Is everything okay? Just, tired. Percy said as he turned his back on Grover, burrowing into his warm blankets and fluffy pillow that smelled like home. His heart clenched. I miss you mom, he thought sullenly. Percy caught Naruto's eyes from across the room. Those eyes that reminded him of the clearest skies were full with unknown emotions. But there was one that he could read easily. Distrust. Naruto didn't trust Grover anymore. He took in the blonde's form, the way his body was coiled beneath his blankets as if he were ready to throw a punch at any sign of a threat from the boy. Percy knew where he was coming from. He didn't know if he really trusted Grover and Mr. Brunner anymore, too. They were talking about them behind their backs about something huge, and it sounded as if they believed that the two best friends were in some kind of danger. The next day, the next afternoon, the boys left the three hour Latin exam with mental exhaustion. I'm an eighth grader in a sixth grade Latin class, Naruto thought grumpily, no wonder since I'm pretty sure I add up really bad on most of the names. When Mr. Brunner called Percy back, Naruto waited outside the classroom for his best friend. Percy, he said, don't be discouraged about leaving Yancey, it's, it's for the best. Naruto cringe. This isn't going to go over too well, he murmured to himself when he saw the downcast look on Percy's face, 
his arms crossed over his chest self-consciously as he listened to what Mr. Brunner had to say. Okay, sir, Percy mumbled, his tone embarrassed. I mean, Mr. Brunner wheeled his chair back and forth, like he wasn't sure what to say. This isn't the right place for you, it was only a matter of time. Right, Percy said, his voice trembling. Naruto knew what his friend was thinking. Mr. Brunner was the only teacher that had believed in him and here he was, saying that he was destined to get kicked out. Naruto shook his head in anger at the man. No, no, Mr. Brunner said. Oh, confound it all. What I'm trying to say, you're not normal Percy. That's nothing to be. Thanks, Percy blurted out. Thanks a lot, for reminding me. Percy, Mr. Brunner tried, but Percy ran out of the classroom before he could get any more words out. Percy passed Naruto, his steps quick. Bud, wait. Naruto said as he put a hand on his friend's shoulder and forcefully turned him around. He was met with sea green eyes that were watered up, reminding Naruto of the ocean. I don't think Mr. Brunner meant what he said. He has a habit of putting his foot in his mouth. He just wants the best for you, dude. Percy nodded, wiping his eyes on his black sleeve. Come on, dude. Let's eat. Naruto said after ruffling his friend's dark hair with brotherly affection. He began walking down the crowded hallway. Percy followed after fixing his now messed up hair with a slight grin on his face. Do you know any places with badass ramen? On the last day of the term, Naruto sat on the same greyhound as Percy and Grover to Manhattan. He lived a few blocks away from Percy, but in the extravagant and rich section of their neighborhood. He was going to go home and hang out with his parents for a few days. He had told Percy that he could come over whenever he wanted because his parents adored him, and Percy gave the same offer to him too. During the whole bus ride, Grover kept glancing nervously down the aisle, watching the other passengers. It occurred to Percy that he'd always acted nervous and fidgety whenever they left Yancey, as if he expected something bad to happen. Before, he always assumed he was worried about getting teased. But there was nobody to tease him on the Greyhound. What's his deal? Naruto asked Percy as he stared at their other friend. Percy shrugged but was staring at Grover with a frown on his tanned face. Let's find out, huh? Percy murmured, his eyes never straying from Grover's form. Both boys leaned over the seat in front of them and looked at the sweating and paranoid Grover. Looking for kindly ones? Percy asked. Grover nearly jumped out of his seat. Well what do you mean? We kind of heard you the other night speaking with Mr. Brunner. What was that all about? Percy questioned, his large sea green eyes burrowing holes into his friend's face. Grover's eye twitched. How much did you guys hear? Oh, not much. What's the summer solstice deadline? Naruto asked nonchalantly as he crossed his arms and tapped his brown Carhartt work boots against the bus's floor. Percy nodded, wanting to know as well. Grover winced. Look, guys, I was just worried about y'all, see? I mean, hallucinating about demon math teachers. Grover, Percy tried, but was rebutted, and I was telling Mr. Brunner that maybe y'all were overstressed or something, because there was no such person as Mrs. Dodds, and Grover, you're a horrible ing liar bud. You see, when you lie, your ears get all pink. Like now, Naruto said, pointing at said boy's ears with a cheeky grin on his whiskered face. From his shirt pocket, he fished out two grubby business cards and handed one to each of them. Just take this, okay? In case you need me this summer. The card was in fancy script, but it said something like. Grover Underwood Keeper Half Blood Hill Long Island, New York. 800-009-0009. Did you make this yourself? It has some fancy ass princess writing on it. Naruto said, eyebrows raised. I always knew you were a girl. He snickered. Grover glared at him only making Naruto laugh harder because he looked similar to an angry and disgruntled goat. Percy rolled his eyes at his friend's words. What's half? Percy began but Grover hushed him, looking around the bus with panicked eyes. Don't say it out loud, he yelped. That's my, um, summer address. Grover, Percy said. What exactly are you trying to protect us from? Before he could answer, there was a huge grinding noise under their feet, Black smoke poured from the dashboard and the whole bus was filled with a smell like rotten eggs. The driver cursed and limped the greyhound over to the side of the highway. Everybody needs to get off, the driver ordered. Balls. 
Naruto groaned as he waited outside with everyone else. Grover and Percy nodded in agreement. They looked around and saw that they were on a stretch of country road. On their side of the road was nothing but maple trees and litter from passing cars. On the other side, across four lanes of asphalt shimmering with afternoon heat, was an old-fashioned fruit stand. There were no customers, just three old ladies in rocking chairs that were knitting the biggest pairs of socks they had ever seen. All three women looked ancient, with pale faces wrinkled like fruit leather, silver hair tied back in white bandanas, bony arms sticking out of bleached cotton dresses. The weirdest thing was, they seemed to be looking right at them, particularly Percy. Hey, why are they staring at us like that? Percy questioned, gaining Naruto's attention. He looked over at three old ladies, who were indeed looking right at them. But he also noticed that most of all their attention was on the green-eyed boy while occasionally taking curious peeks at him as though he was a treasure that they wanted nothing more but to keep. To be honest, it creeped the hell out of him. Naruto and Percy looked over at Grover who they saw had the blood drained from his face. His nose was twitching. Grover? Percy asked. Hey, man, tell me they're not looking at you. They are, aren't they? Yeah. Weird, huh? You think those socks would fit me? Percy snickered, his cheeks turning pink. Naruto snorted. Nah, you're too short munchkin. He laughed, getting a punch to the arm from his best friend for the short comment. The blonde pouted. I'm not short jackass. You're just a giant. They're probably making those socks just for you, Sasquatch. Naruto glared. Take. That. Back. He growled. No. Yes. No, Percy insisted, his eyes filled with determination while the side of his mouth twitched in amusement. Yes. No. Yes. No. No. Yee. Percy's eyes lit on fire. Hey, you cheated. Naruto smiled smugly lifting the collar of his brown leather jacket up a little more with flourish. So? He questioned innocently, blue eyes sparkling with mischievousness. You're such a jerk. Percy pouted. Bitch. Naruto said automatically, a handsome grin etched onto his face. Not funny guys. Not funny at all. Grover moaned, sounding like he was going to be sick. This isn't the time to joke. We need to get back on the bus. He glanced over at the three old ladies again and paled even further when the lady in the middle pulled out a huge pair of scissors, gold and silver, long bladed, like shears. He caught his breath. Now. He insisted, taking hold of his friend's sleeves. Hey bud, watch the leather. Naruto sassed but complied with his friends urging anyway. He looked back over to the three old ladies himself and narrowed his eyes when he saw the one in the middle cut the yarn with a loud snip that Naruto with his kitsune hearing could hear with no problem. Odd, he mused to himself, this seems really familiar. At the rear of the bus, the driver wrenched a big chunk of smoking metal out of the engine compartment. The bus shuddered, and the engine roared back to life. The passengers cheered. Darn right, yelled the driver. He slapped the bus with his hat. Everybody back on board. Naruto looked over his shoulder back at the three old ladies that he got a deadly and dangerous vibe from, but they were gone, leaving behind nothing but balled up electric blue socks carelessly thrown on the middle seat. I have a really bad feeling about this.